So even though you live in a natural world, you are a spirit being. There is a spirit world or spiritual world inside of you. Inside of you, you are a spiritual person. And the greatest thing, source of power in the spiritual world is the word of God. Hebrews 4.14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. I like the way this verse puts it. Let's hold fast our confession. There is something called our confession that we must hold on to that is emphasized here in this verse, as well as in chapter 3, verse 1, where in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Saying, Con consider the one whom you've been confessing as your Lord and Savior, as your everything. So there is a confession that the believers are to hold fast and to 
constantly make. That's the confession we're talking about. And confession of sins is not that confession. Confession of sins is something that you do when you sin. And I hope you're not sinning every day and all the time so that uh, all you have to offer is the confession of sins, you know. Uh, once in a while it happens and it's important to confess and get rid of it. But our confession is the confession of the believer it's referring to and we identified that. And I gave you five examples of our confession, five general areas and then five particular examples. Confession of Jesus as Lord, confessing saying that uh, you don't have any worry, confessing that uh, you don't uh, uh, have any needs, uh, that uh, he meets all your needs, uh, confessing that he bore your sin, sickness, and curse, and everything, so that you don't have to bear it, confessing that he's your wisdom, and so on. I hope you're doing it. Just try it. It's good medicine for your soul. <laughs> it's good medicine for your life. So that's positive confession. The reason why we call this positive confession is that people not only just confess the fact that they are sinners when they sin, that they have sinned. Sometimes, even when they're not sinning, Christians go into a negative kind of confession. Have you ever noticed some Christians, they're not confessing sins, but they confess something negative. How? They say, Lord, I'm unworthy, I'm dust, I'm worm, I'm nothing but junk, you know. Uh, and if you ask them, they say, even Paul said that... Uh, I consider it all garbage, you know, my past, my education, my uh, qualification, and my religious uh, uh, background and all of that. He says he considered them as nothing but dung. He uses the word dung, you know, that's a pretty strong word. So they say, see, he used that word, nothing wrong. We should also say it like that. That's what true humility is all about. No, 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 Paul was making a point there. Compared to the knowledge of Christ, that is dung, he says. It is nothing when compared to the knowledge of Christ. He was not going around all the time saying, I'm nothing but dung, you know. See, you should not take the scriptures and twist it and turn it and turn it negatively against you, you know. You should not call yourself nothing but dung just because Paul mentioned in one place that, you know, even though he's highly qualified and has a very great religious upbringing and all that, Compared with the knowledge of Christ, he considers that as a dung. He's trying to make a point there, get the point, and don't hold on to something unnecessary. Some people have held on to that. They're holding fast to that confession, that they're nothing but dung. Now, some people say, well, Abraham said, I'm nothing but dust in the Old Testament. You know, when he went to God interceding for Lot, his uh, relative that was in Sodom, he said, we are nothing but dust, you know. Abraham also was trying to make a point there in the Old Testament and so on. He was not going around, Abraham was not going around every day saying, I'm nothing but dust, I'm unworthy dust, you know. It was not like that. You should not take it like that. It's wrong to take it like that. So people are into negative confession. They say, I'm nothing but dust and a worm and no good rotten thing, you know. This is what they are, uh, usually do. But I showed you that's not humble. That's actually pride. God says you're an heir, joint heir with Jesus. God says you're more than a conqueror. God says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God says that you are a world overcomer. Why don't you say that? See, confession is saying the same as God. That's what confession is. God has said something, you simply say the same thing. That's what positive confession is. Now, I'm going behind and explaining to you the logic behind this whole idea of positive confession. I've given you many examples. If you hear my series on faith in the past, there will be a lot of examples given about uh, how people used this positive confession, how it worked and so on. I talk about in the Old Testament how Abraham used it and how David, you know, before killing Goliath, he five times said what he's going to do. What's going to happen to Goliath? He already declared before it happened. And whatever he declared, that's what happened. All of these things I've talked about, and I don't want to go over it again. In the New Testament, I gave you many examples of confession also, like Mary and, uh, and Zacharias and so on. But we want to talk about the doctrinal basis for this positive confession. If you want to put it in a worldly way, 
of talking, you know. I speak to the world a lot of time on television and all that, so I don't try to be very religious and employ religious words. If I was talking to mainly Christians, I would say, what is the doctrinal basis? If I was talking to generally anybody, I would say, what is the logic behind this? Why do we insist on positive confession? Why is positive confession so important? So let's explore the logic. We began last week. The first thing we told you is that positive confessions are important because faith-filled words dominate, dominate the law of death, uh, the law of sin and death. There is a law that is in operation ever since Adam sinned. I showed you from Romans chapter 8, verse 2, where Paul says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. There are two laws. One law is the law of sin and death. Death does not mean that you fall down and die. Death is, have you heard some people, you know, they have, they're married and they have a lot of difficulties in their married life or something like that. They'll say, daily I'm dying. Have you heard that? I'm dying daily. Every day, I'm dying daily, they say. All they're going through some financial difficulties, you know, debt and other problems, uh, unhappiness, some sort of struggle they're going through. They'll say, every day, I'm going, you know, going through death, they say. That's the kind of death it's talking about. Law of sin and death. It's not that the man is dead. Sometimes dead is better, you know. <laughs> this is a life that brings in all kinds, of the, all kinds of negative things into it. Sin and death. Sin brings everything that is negative into it. Pulls you down, destroys you, grounds you literally, so that you will not be able to rise. Law of sin and death. That is an operation. Adam in the Garden of Eden, when he sinned, inaugurated it, began it, and it has been continuing ever since. It is very much in operation even today. But... Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to set us free from the law of sin and death. That law that pulls us down, defeats us, grounds us so that we do not rise. That is the law of the spirit of life. See, death versus life. This is a law that leads to life. If death is, death is a kind of life that has everything that is negative, then life is a kind of living where you experience joy and peace and happiness and thrive and flourish in this world. That is what is described as life. Life is not just breathing. Life is not just staying alive and your pulse is ticking, you know. Life is more than that. Life is really living. Life is really eternal life that Bible talks about. Life is really having the God kind of life in you. So... The law of the spirit of life, that has been inaugurated ever since Jesus came and died on the cross and rose again. He has made possible for us who live in the midst of this law of sin and death. He has made possible for us to live in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We don't have to fall prey to the law of sin and death anymore. We don't have to be grounded all the time. We don't have to be defeated. We don't have to be kept down. Now we can rise above our problems, uh, win victories through the help uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the life that he brings. There is a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that is operating. It's only in Christ Jesus, not apart from him. It is for, for people who believe and act by faith. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is available. The law of sin and death takes you down, pulls you down. The law of the spirit of life lifts you up, brings you up. Now, how do you set into motion the law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death? See, those two laws, how do you set them on? It's like turning on. How do you set them on? The the ability to set them on is placed in man's tongue. Even the law of sin and death is, is set on by the tongue. You read James chapter 3, it says, it talks about how tongue, this little fire that kindles great fire, you know. It puts the whole forest, uh, you know, into trouble because little fire kindleth the whole thing, you know, and, 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 and it, it, the whole place can catch, up, catch in fire. It can start very little. Tongue is like that, the Bible says. And there it says, 
it literally is a it it brings a force of death into life it destroys the life cycle james chapter 3 says life cycle itself is destroyed suppose you can live 8 90 years 100 years by just talking you can reduce it hello by the tongue you can reduce it that's what the bible says it sets on fire the cycle of life the very cycle of life amazing so the law of sin and death is set into motion by the tongue tongue is the key when the devil got a hold of adam the key to defeating adam and the adamic race ever since he got a hold of adam has been the tongue the tongue is the thing that is the problem and it has always been the problem and similarly when it comes to the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus that is also set in motion it's available its power is available it will lift you it will free you it will deliver you it will cause you to win victories but it is set in motion by turning on the switch and the switch this good god has kept in your mouth god invented the remote control long before the japanese and the americans did it otherwise some people will lay in their sofas and says lord my life is sinking but i don't feel like getting up and turning it on turning life on i'm so tired i'm so sick i'm worn i'm weak i can't do it they'll be laying down so god said i'll put it in your mouth even laying down in your hospital bed you can speak life you have even pinned down to your bed you can speak life and come out of it come out of that death you know so god put the switch in the mouth if the whole place is wired and all the fixtures are in place and everything is connected to the city electric uh, electrical supply if you don't turn the switch on you're not going to have light you're not going to have cool air here you got to turn the switch on similarly if god has done everything for you through redemption if you do not appropriate it with your mouth and with your confession even though everything has been prepared you cannot enjoy even a little bit the key is the tongue so that is why the positive confession is very important you begin to appropriate what is available for you this law of the spirit of life that is available for you this power that will lift you up from your problems that is available can be availed only through the use of your tongue your confession is so important that is the logic behind it so the second thing we come to the second thing now the second thing is there is the second logic behind it is this there is a there are two worlds let me begin there there are two worlds one is the world we see it's a seen natural world the other is the unseen world there is an unseen world some of you may be surprised to hear that there is an unseen world what is there in the unseen world first of all god is there god is in the unseen world he exists in the unseen realm he is an unseen god god is here in our midst we say do we see him we don't see him do you feel him in your body or something no no but he is there he is uh, he is he cannot be perceived by our senses only natural things can be perceived by our senses god is there he is invisible we cannot see him but he is as real as any one of us sitting here i would say that he is even more real than you and me sitting here you touch yourself you feel yourself you know that you are here you are alive and you are present some people doubt that you know one fellow said am i you know say yeah feel you pinch yourself and see if you are so you can feel yourself but more real than that is god who you cannot see and cannot feel he is here there is a spiritual realm God's angels are here. The Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps around that, that them that fear him. So if that is true, there are angels here. As you go out from this place and as you travel and as you go places, the angels of God are there. 
and coming around you. Do you see them? You don't see them, but they are there. We Christians believe that the angels of God are there. We Christians believe that, that God is with us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So when we go, God goes with us. You know, when the people of Israel moved, the cloud went with them. You know, when they camped in one place, when they got up and left to go, they would say, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. <laughs> they said that when they got up to leave, that God rose up with them and God went with them and before them. And the enemies of God's people were scattered, you know. God's presence was real to them, even though they could not see him. So there is an unseen world. There is a seen world. This natural world and the spiritual world. The world of nature and the world of the spirit. Now, these two different worlds are there. Now, we live in the seen world. You and I, right now, we are living in the seen world. Uh, we exist in a way that you, can, you and I can see one another. We are looking at at least one another's bodies, right? But, even though we live in the natural world, we are very special in a way. You know why? Because we are spirits. Because God is a spirit, he made us a spirit. We are spirit beings, actually, that live in a body. That is what is so special with us. The God who is a spirit has made man as a spirit and put him in a body. So even though you live in a natural world, you are a spirit being. There is a spirit world or spiritual world inside of you. Inside of you, you are a spiritual person. And the greatest thing, source of power in the spiritual world is the word of God. In the spiritual world, the greatest source of power is the word of God. See, God who is unseen, exists in the spiritual realm, in the unseen realm, created the whole world. How did he create the whole world? He created by the word. By faith we understand, Hebrews 11.3 says, that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things that we see did not come into being as a result of the things that do appear. They didn't come from things that you see. They come, came from things that you do not see. God made them. How did God make them? This unseen God, how did he make this, this seen world? He made it through his word. So I would say to you, the greatest power of the unseen realm is the word of God. Nothing greater than that. In the unseen world, the greatest power is the word of God. And that word of God is the thing that created everything that you see right now in this world. Now, we as spiritual beings, you and I, we are spirits, we are told to take the word and put it in our heart and in our mouth. The word must be in our mouth and in our heart. In other words, he's saying, you're a spirit being, you're a spiritual person, you live in a natural world, but don't worry about the problems of the natural world and the difficulties you're facing in the natural world. I made you as a spiritual being. You can operate on a different level. You can operate on the level that God operates. You're living here, but you're a spiritual being. So while you're living here, take the word of God and put it in your mouth and in your heart. Fill your heart with God's word because that is the source of the greatest power in the spiritual world. And that is the power which created this earth, earth and everything in it, the seen world. So that power, the power of the word is not only the greatest power in the spiritual world, it is a power that is bigger than any power in the natural world because it is the power that created everything in the natural world. So God says, even though you live here in the natural world, you can operate spiritually by speaking the word of God over your problems. Speaking the word of God over your difficulties. There is a spiritual world and the natural world.
Of our warfare are not of this world, they are mighty to God, mighty to God. The power of His mercy and the power of His love they are stronger than all, stronger than all. And worship in unity, Jesus the Lord, victory comes in, made by His word, not by power. Not by mind, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by power, not by mind, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The weapons of our warfare are not of this world, they are mighty to God, mighty to God. The power of His mercy. Power of His love is stronger than all, stronger than all. We worship in unity, Jesus is the Lord. Victory comes in His name by His word, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by power, not by might. Let's be. 